Oh, you're the host for today. Yeah, yeah okay, I'll do today. No, 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 I'll do it today. <laughs> you need him for the next one, because um, I'm in... I just, I'm heading to Reading next week, so it depends what the date is. I'm back. It'll be the first Friday of next month. I'm back for that. Is this recording, Richard? Yes, it is. Cool. <laughs> You're live on the internet, Anthony. <laughs> but clothed this time. <laughs> Thank you. Go on. <laughs> Rightio. I, I'm, I'm that wonderful man. <laughs> Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to come to Quickers Your DevOps User Group. I see a lot of new faces here today, which is excellent. I'm not going to give a big introduction today. I'll leave that for Anthony. Thank you. <laughs> I'll leave it for Anthony. However, I did want to show you one thing that I found most amusing over the over this week was so I assume everyone here knows about Windows Terminal, the new open source terminal, right? I was watching Scott Hansel and you know, he tweeted something and I had a look and I thought this is the most amusing thing ever. He oh, small things amuse small minds, whatever. So he's gone and done this. A build breaks and it shows a GIF. When the, he goes and fixes the fixes it, runs the build again and he shows a different GIF. GIF GIF. <laughs> I, I thought that was one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time, and I've, he had a Twitch stream out, uh, which if you go look for it, you should be able to find it easily enough, of him hacking this together in an hour from first principles. It was a delight to watch, I will have to admit. So, um, without further ado, um, I'll welcome Anthony to give us a presentation. We haven't seen him around for a while, so it's, you know, it's really great to have him back and giving a, a much more polished presentation than I usually give, so please, welcome Anthony. Excellent, thank you guys. I'll go and reset my slides, Richard. No, that's, well, we, we are paying you for that, mate. Actually, no, we're not. <laughs> Alrighty, so thanks for coming along. Uh, we're gonna talk about some DevSecOps using Azure DevOps. Uh, my name's Anthony Borton, I'm a DevOps architect with Microsoft's uh, DevOps CAT team. One of, uh, at the moment, six DevOps CAT architect guys. Um, so I get the pleasure of traveling around helping some of our biggest customers uh, with their DevOps adoption. So I, it was, it's, it's amazing to be back home for just a little while I leave again on Sunday morning. Um, but I've decided to do something a little bit different. So under the guise of security, the picture in the background, what is it? Who can tell me? Is it a so bunker? Nuclear's in there. So it's actually the control room for uh, a Titan II missile silo, one of, I think it was something like 52 or 57 that was spread across continental USA. So this one's um, been basically refurbished as a tourist attraction. So you can literally go and have a look at a decommissioned uh, missile silo. It's just outside of um, Tucson in Arizona. Um, really quite fascinating stuff to sort of go in there and speak to some of the people that manned the area. And, and you look at it and you think, <coughs> this is where the world could have ended sort of thing. Um, and the technology is interesting. So um, big spring release is just the missile. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this level of sophistication at this time was, was nothing at all. I mean, as soon as the button is pushed, the chemicals start mixing. As soon as that happens, there is no kill switch. There was no, oops, that was a mistake. The chemical mixes, that's gonna launch and land wherever it was pre-programmed to land, the end of the story. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. Over here's the, you know, the typical, the, the lock with the launch codes, the two keys and everything. Um, and listening to some of the people there where they did, did drills and they didn't know it was drills. And if your colleague doesn't get the key and turn the key thinking that this is, you know, this is real, we don't know. Um, you pull out a sidearm and shoot them. Um, it's, it's fascinating stuff and thank God it's, um, you know, it's a story we, society lives to tell. So. Yeah, so each of the little things in the background there are little little photos and pictures. I just can't remember the date, the date on the back of it. Anyway, so that's me up there. Um, nothing really interesting. All right, so in getting started with the idea of security, I want to talk about this uh, award-winning documentary. Has anyone seen it? Icarus. Yeah, it's, brilliant. It, it's, it's fascinating and alarming at the same time. So it starts out with the cyclist saying that, you know, hey, I want, I want to basically succeed like all the other cyclists that you know, do it the way they do it. 
So he literally starts injecting himself with all the different drugs and things, and human growth hormone, and you sort of see him injecting, you see all the bruising, all the things, it's like, wow, wow, it was really, really quite confronting. And it sort of moves on to talk about uh, the, the doping and water uh, and what went on at the Olympics. So it's really, it's, it's sort of fascinating and scary at the same time. And there are some parallels there that I want to talk about um, in terms of you know, thinking like an attacker. If you have a look here, this is the Russian Olympic team in Vancouver, their results. And this is Sochi, have a look at that. They've done so much better. They must be training harder, working, you know, yay, yay, go Russians, right? Of course, of course. So, how did that all come about? So, firstly, we start with an unbreakable, secure drug testing bottle. <laughs> and then you figure out you can tamper proof, you know, you can tamper with the tamper proof bottle. So you start with a misconception, a feeling of safety and security, it's tamper proof. And then you reverse engineer it and you figure out how it works and then you tamper with it. Okay? So there's that sense of of security. It's tamper proof. And then you know someone makes the claim, someone states that we paid money for that to be made tamper proof, therefore it's tamper proof. Um, and then people just believed that and didn't bother um, you know, reassessing and, and continuing to look at that process. It's like saying, hey, we've got strong firewalls and we feel super safe knowing that we've got strong firewalls out there. And that gives us this sense of you know, safety and security, which is completely a false sense. So what they did was they basically, um, and watch the movie, I'm not going to remember the exact details, but where they set up the laboratory to do the drug testing was conveniently across the road from the FSB. Excellent. You don't want to have to make the guys catch an Uber too far. And under the guise of cleaners, they would enter the building at night. They would go into a cleaning closet, which happened to be coincidentally right next door to the room where the samples were taken and kept. Okay? So there's an elevation of privilege they basically figure out a way to get in. And then they use that privilege to move laterally. That's an important concept when we think about security. Okay, um, what's the saying? Um, defenders think in lists, attackers think in... Ah, misquoting a really good thing, crud. I'll, I'll find out what that exactly should be. Uh, but basically they look at an elevation and then they move laterally across. Um, examples of that would be things like um, the target breach in the US in 2013, where it all came about by the theft of credentials from a company charged with taking care of their HVAC, their air conditioning. So this external provider that did this job for many different businesses had cr credentials because they needed to be able to get into the network to be able to go and have a look at telemetry being gathered by the air conditioning systems that need to monitor, monitor those things. Ideally, you would have network segmentation, right? In hindsight, it sounds like a great idea. They didn't. So by grabbing things from this company, they were able to laterally move across and get into the target network. They were able to install malware on a limited number of point of sale machines and holy heck, this stuff works they start skimming credit card details. It's like, oh, this is awesome. So then they just go to town and this malware is then spread through the majority of the point of sale systems through Target in the US. Um, and they, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers, it was scary the number of credit cards they were able to secure there. And that's that lateral movement. Get in over here, move across the network, and then once you're in there, you know, the world's your oyster, so to speak. Okay. So in this particular case, they were able to get in there and you had this little innocuous little thing sitting uh, on the ground and that was where they were able to pass the samples through from a secure locked room. The samples could be passed through that little hole into the cleaning cupboard where you know, the FSB agents could get those samples. Now the samples were anonymised, right? Except when the sample was taken, the athlete would use their phone and take a photograph of the anonymous bottle with the barcode on it. Uh, making it incredibly easy for them to match 
the barcode back to the particular athlete. Okay. That's not rocket science, is it? That's simple stuff. Um, you let them take a device into the room where the sample is occurring. Yeah. So that's that lateral movement. Sorry, there's a lot there to read. But in terms of the anti-doping lab director, what you see there is that uh, he was sent a list of the samples that needed to be swapped out and changed, the sample <coughs> photograph included in there. He duck in there usually after midnight into room 124, um, and that's where the various activities happened. There was basically a spreadsheet, and what they found is that a third of the athletes that received medals, um, their names were on that list, which isn't to say that the others were not part of the various activities, but, but you know, the, the evidence was there. It's really well documented. Uh, so I mean, you can find out what was going on there. So we've got to change our, our mindset. That mindset's got to become assume breach. Okay, from the former director of the NSA and CIA, uh, you know, two things. Number one, you're in the fight whether you thought you were or not, and number two, you are almost certainly penetrated. That's our mindset. If you look at the Microsoft network, we assume absolutely that there are nefarious actors on that network. Some of the you know, red team activities have involved putting a Raspberry Pi finding an unsecured network port behind a coffee machine. You know, just crazy things like that, uh, where they've had to chain multiple, you know, uh, multiple attacks to get anywhere. We've got you know, good detection and all sorts of things in place. But you know, down to Staples, print one of these, use a social engineering attack, sneak in behind someone into a cafeteria, find the coffee machine, put a little Raspberry Pi in there, grab some test credentials or something, move across the network. Uh, you know, it's not the matter of, of, of just finding one exploit and using it. They've really got to chain a lot of exploits together. But perimeter security is important, but we need more than just that perimeter security. All right, where's that one? No, I don't think you're going to guess this one. So when I was traveling to the US all the time and staying in Redmond, right next door to the hotel I was in, there was an old car yard. And that was the fence. It was the car yard. <laughs> no, see, I knew you wouldn't get that one. You didn't recognize it? No? It's, it's a whole lot of expensive apartments now anyway. So modern DevOps uh, practices can really help in the area of security. Okay. We're going to talk about probably two of the largest single significant factors. That is credential theft and exploit of known vulnerabilities. Also talk about reducing our attack surface and trying to keep things like our Azure um, network resources safe and secure um, through the use of settings. That one, that was in Bangkok about four weeks ago. Um, as the start of the monsoonal season started, so that was an hour and a half in foot deep traffic traveling five kilometers from the UN back to my hotel. Uh, it was great watching the tuk-tuks try and quickly get to high ground. Um, it was amazing and the, it's not an Uber, it's a grab over there. But the grab, I ordered a, a, an SUV and I'm so glad because you sort of, there were sections where the water's halfway up the door of some, uh, some taxis over there. So you go, yeah, it's not a good day. Um, and then you're just driving along there uh, and the little motorbikes are so going through all the different water. It was fascinating, it was great. Credential theft. Okay, you know where that one is. That one's in Washington. So, and these, these are the worst. These are the guys that steal most. Uh, sorry. That's what I'm to say. You are live, remember. Oh, whoops. <laughs> and you are a Microsoft employee. Oops. All right. So, in terms of theft, phishing still remains one of the single most commonly used things because it's incredibly easy to cast a net over millions of people. It's just an email. Despite spending enormous amounts of time, energy, money on educating our <coughs> own staff within <coughs> our team, an email was sent out, this is a few years ago now, which is why we're able to talk about it and share it, but basically they sent out this email up here saying, hey, a new Lumia built specifically for Windows 10. Now, awesome. Uh, there were some typing mistakes up there, spelling issues, there was a Microsoft logo that had the wrong aspect ratio. There are all sorts of red flags there. The email address sender was really, really bad as well. And it basically said, sign up now. 
And it also said, do not forward this. <laughs> We're taught, in fact, in inside our Outlook, there's a button to click to report any suspicious email. We're told just click it. If in doubt, click this button to report it. It'll be then investigated. But there's no punishment if it's a false flag, not a closed market. So if in doubt, just click it. Yeah. Send the report that it could be a phishing or uh, not a good email. So what we found there is that 220 people clicked the sign up button. Oops. Wow. <coughs> Out of a total of, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a significant proportion. First thing says, oh, so we can make sure you're eligible for this. What are your credentials? Oops. <laughs> Uh, that was a bit of a shame. We then told everyone what it was. Oh, then heaps of people forwarded it, despite it specifically say, saying, don't forward this. We then told people it was a phishing attack and you know, uh, you really need to try harder. We then sent it out again and 37 people clicked it again. <laughs> God damn it. And these are smart people. <laughs> um, no matter how smart these people are, no matter how much you educate them, this still remains to be one of the single most significant things. Think of the phone calls that we're all getting. I got a new one the other day. Hi, Anthony, this is you know, um, Fred Jones from this, the Commonwealth Bank. He literally said the Commonwealth Bank. Um, he had a typical you know, accent, but chose a good Western name. And he said, oh, we're just, uh, just looking after your security. We'll just notice there's a transfer of $900 going to the US to some other you know, US name like uh, Candy Smith. Um, <laughs> do you authorize that? And I went, yes. <laughs> just, just silence. He's going. No one says yes. Um, no, no. So we can we can go ahead and transfer this money. Yes, and then he just hung up. <laughs> <laughs> that was new to me. That was a completely new one. Yeah. So you know exactly where it was going to go. Oh no. Oh well. Then we're concerned that your account could have been compromised. Can you please give us the account numbers in question and so forth? You know, just how many people is that going to? It's got to be capturing. People have got to be falling for it. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't waste their time doing this. So for every person that's smart enough to identify that as being fraudulent and a scam, there's got to be people that fall for it every single day, which is, uh, which is a shame. There's also very sophisticated attacks, spear phishing attacks, where people are individually targeted. One of the you know, most famous ones was the campaign chairman for Hillary's campaign, where he received an email saying, hey, your Gmail's been compromised, reset your password. So we went, oh, sure. And just types in his username and password. The rest is history. We know how that worked out. Not so well. So we need to protect our identity. These days, multi-factor authentication is a must. If you're a, uh, an Office 365 user, you'll see how we wrap all of those links uh, to try and help uh, Office 365 or Azure Active Directory gives us multi-factor authentication. We're all carrying around multiple devices these days. So there's a lot of things there we can do to start to help. And step one, turn on MFA for everything you possibly can. Okay? Who's ever seen something like that? <laughs> all right, who's ever done something like that? <laughs> yes, of course we have. Um, but you know what? It's okay. They're just test accounts, right? <laughs> That's the excuse often given. These are test accounts. We need testers to be able to use them, so we've got to be able to see them. And then we'll be able to find them. We'll just throw it in a little file here, and then the testers can get to it. You, Mr. Tester, have you seen this before? Unfortunately. Excellent. <laughs> audience participation coming up here for a minute. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tester. All right. And just not to take your details. <laughs> <laughs> just, just over here. All right, just stand there for a minute. Yeah, um, you're out of view. <laughs> I wanted to cover the screen. Yeah, that's it. That's it? Okay, excellent. Just saying that. So, these test accounts, because they're test accounts, we don't give them the due respect that we should. Of these test accounts, how many of them are local administrator on the machines they're used on? No, they're just test machines, too, remember? What do you think? All of them. One is bad. Probably. <laughs> 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 that's the password, not the user. Yeah. So we go and create these accounts. Sometimes there's you know, possibly service accounts or something. We put them in plain text files. Prior to Windows 10, there was a really interesting exploit there where you could put malware on there that would get into the LSA SS. Um, what's it called? It starts with M. Local security. Um, yes, excellent. 
So that was a great way where someone would log on with these accounts that would allow the exploit to get in. Once that was there, as soon as someone logged off and then used their developer accounts, which are often administrator accounts as well, they've now got that. Then they can start scanning the network using actual human credentials. Um, again, that's the, the lateral movement side of things. So this is not uncommon. We also do things like putting in, um, <laughs> where <are> you go. <laughs> we also do things like put in uh, reversible encryption. We, what are you concerned that you walked away? No, that's fine. You can fulfill the purpose. The challenge is, what was that purpose? So, <laughs> so we put in things like symmetric keys, we put in certificates, we put in uh, access tokens to allow us to get to blob storage in Azure, or all sorts of interesting things. We put in our code. Okay, who's, who's never done that? <laughs> For the purpose of those watching from home, no one put their hand up just then. <laughs> Bit of honesty there. All right. I, I, I haven't. Good. All right, so how do we find those credentials? There's a tool called CredScan, the Credential Scanner. So it's a great starting point. You can go and download this as part of the Cont Continuous Delivery Tools or Visual Studio. It's something that we use ourselves internally. And this goes into our pull request workflow. So in our pull request, when, someone, when a developer wants to commit to master, one of the things we do is we trigger a build. As part of that build, we go and scan all of the code looking for anything that could be a credential. And if we find anything that causes a flag there, we block that commit. Okay. We want to try and stop these things getting into the code base. Okay. Not, it's not perfect. Okay. I mean, Git, distributed version control, they've committed to their local machine with credentials a thousand times. You know, okay, we can't do anything about that yet. Um, but we can stop that getting into master. Uh, we use regular expressions, a whole lot of pattern matching things there. Um, version two of this has got a lot more sophisticated context that we're searching. <laughs> you get that? Yeah. All right. So, uh, so the credit scan's developed by Microsoft. Uh, it looks for things like default passwords, strings, certificates, private keys, and so on. It's a task that you can easily put into the pipeline. So we go and drop this little task into the pipeline. There's a few settings there. You really can, it's, it's drag and drop, set and forget, bring it across, let go, and it will scan by default the, um, the source directory looking for these sorts of things. The gotcha though, regardless of what it finds, if it completes its task, it's a success. So it could find hundreds of passwords and your pipeline goes, woohoo, let's release. <laughs> yeah. So there's just that little bit of extra work to do. Thanks for your help earlier, Matthew. That's much appreciated. All right, so we add the cred scan task to our build. We then need to be able to report on the output. So in addition to this one task, there are generally three other tasks you're going to want to add to the pipeline. There will be additional tools available. There is a private preview at the moment uh, to allow that you can sign up for for your organization. And that will give you access to additional scanning tools, things like our uh, Microsoft Risk Protection <coughs> Service for, for doing fuzzing, uh, bin skim, some of the T <coughs> TS Linter, uh, some of the Roslyn analyzers. So you can sign up for that private preview and have that activated on your Azure DevOps account. So what this one does is the security analysis report can go and create uh, a CSV, TSV, or an HTML file. Okay. Um, what's really interesting is a lot of these static scanning tools, they produce output in a variety of different formats. It could be pretty fast. Hey, buddy, good to see you, Damien. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> You're late for breakfast. What yeah. is it? Why did turn it off? It's all over. <laughs> a lot of these tools will produce multiple different outputs, and that's a challenge. So how do we get a single pane of glass to show us the results of all of these scanning tools? So Microsoft spearheaded the creation of something called SARIF. Okay? Um, static analysis results interchange format. So it went through OASIS standards, so version two of it is now an OASIS standard, and there has been interest and support by a lot of these tool vendors. So ideally, hopefully, we'll start to see more and more of these um, tools outputting a common form. <coughs> okay. So for now, this does a great job of consolidating all of the log files these different tools create. We then want to go and publish those logs. 
So one of the typical things we do is we create this little task here, it grabs the logs for us, creates it as an artifact, and adds that into the build for us. So that's nice. So we go and fetch the source, we create the built artifact that we're going to possibly release, and we create the artifact containing the results of the security scanning. So they're both available for us to take on the journey. Really, really nice, keeps the auditors happy too. Finally, we do want to say, if an issue has been found, we want to break the build. Because remember, if these tools successfully execute, the step is a pass. So it could find all sorts of problems and issues, um, and then still report green for us. So this particular step here has a single job, and that is if there was a problem, break now. Okay. So what you want to do is put in the scanners and checkers that you want to use, and then see these three tools, three, uh, sorry, three tasks, they will almost always be found together. What I've done here is, in my example, I've chosen to execute them before even doing any testing. If there's a security issue found, don't even bother testing. We're, we're done, we're done here. Security problem, that's the only thing you've got to worry about. Okay. Oh, <coughs> where's that one? Guggenheim, isn't it? Sorry? Guggenheim? No, no, but that's very close. I, I, I can see how you see that one. No, that's a shopping centre in Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, close as in, yeah, if you go, right. If you go round, 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 round to the top, there's a really great <coughs> place at the top, and also Din Tai Fung, which is also delicious. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, really cheap over there too. All right, let's have a look at that. You guys are going to get one of these. I'm optimistic. All right, so let's go across into... This one. So what you see here is Parts Unlimited. So Parts Unlimited is one of those um, applications that the demo generator creates for us, which is really, really helpful. And if I go and have a look at a pipeline here, look at a build pipeline, here's a standard thing. And in the interest of time this morning, I won't worry about showing you that. But if we, if we execute the build, the standard build out of the box, it's all going to go green. And we say, excellent, all green. We'll go and release it, right? And of course, that's entrapment. You all go, sure. <laughs> so then I'm going to go and say, well, let's create a new pipeline. Um, in the interest of demonstration, we'll just use the classic editor. Uh, that's all fine. Next. It's a, what's it? Let's paste it on there. We'll go with that one. All right. So there's out of the box, if I was to execute that, it'll find the test, the test will pass, everything's good. So how can I start improving the security of this particular pipeline. So I'll go into uh, somewhere there, and I'm going to set, want to add a new task, and the task we're going to add there is the credential scanner. Okay. So we've fetched the source up here. I'll put it in after, uh, I'll probably put it in there before we build. Make a lot of difference. In terms of the settings here, my different outputs that I can choose from, um, It'll always grab the latest version of it. By default, we're going to scan the build uh, sources directory. It's got a number of searches. So searches are basically JSON files, and they tell us what we're going to go and look for. There are, uh, don't quote me, 36 searches at the moment. The next version of this will have considerably more of them. Okay. Uh, and their job is to go and scan and try and identify things. And, it's really, really hard. I mean, it's got to be context aware. It's got to know that, hey, this is a SAS token to access some resources in Azure. This is actually a password. It will generate some false flags because in a lot of cases, you might have placeholders in config files where a value will be substituted as part of a release pipeline. Very common, isn't it? So if it sees password equals percent password, um, it could false flag that. In fact, it almost definitely with version one will. You absolutely can. So where I've done this for some customers is create custom searches, and sometimes those searches have nothing to do with security. I mean, it's, it's going and scanning code. So what they were finding is developers were hard coding HTTPS um, and HTTP endpoints in their code, instead of having those values injected through the release from configuration. So we wrote one that went and looked for, you know, HTTP, HTTPS, hard coded values in their code. So that wasn't really, wasn't really a security focus, that was more just managing configuration and so forth. Okay. So you can definitely write your own. 
The other thing you're going to want to do is there will be some false flags, okay? Uh, so there is a suppressions file over here somewhere, uh, suppressions file. Again, another JSON file where you can go and say, <coughs> I want to su suppress uh, scans for this particular file, this particular rule, and so on. You've got to manage that. So right now, I tend to like to keep those suppression files with the application source code. It's, can you see the potential problem with that? I mean, it's there, we can lock it down, secure it, it's versioned, we've got audibility and traceability of it, but if, if it was a developer with access that wanted to do these bad things, the developers <laughs> could go and modify that file. <coughs> so whether you then want to go and put it into a separate repository and strictly limit who can access that file, it's, it's something to be considered. Okay? Um, but I would always create a suppressions file per application we're building, um, you don't really want to have a global suppression file because um, every application is likely to have different things, different flags. If you do put it in after these NuGet packages, things like, um, I was with a customer last week, they had a uh, NuGet. NuGet was pulling down uh, log4net. When the log4net package comes down and gets expanded, there's a config file with an actual username and password in it. You know, we don't control that. Uh, and it is substituted out. So nonetheless, you really probably shouldn't have that in the package when you publish it to nuget.org. Anyway, so a uh, little email saying, hey dude, can you really do something different here for your own benefit? Uh, and then we just suppress that one for the, for the customer. So all we've done here is we've gone ahead and done our scanning. We could run this, everything will be green. So the next thing I want to do is go and add another task. And this particular task is going to be, uh, I want to do a security analysis report we want to publish the logs, and I want to do a post analysis. Okay, so they're the three typical ones you're going to use. Uh, I'll output the results of the logging to the uh, console. I'll create a human readable HTML file. I'll say we want to use CredScan, get information from CredScan. Okay. Uh, this one says we want to publish the logs. So it goes and fetches the logs from all of the tools that we put into the pipeline brings them together, creates that artifact for us. Then finally, and uh, there's nothing really to do here, we just say, this is the name of it. Okay. Uh, we want to go to post analysis. So this basically says we want to go and have a look at um, breaking the build if we find <coughs> any problems. So it's kind of a matter of moments there. Let's go ahead and save and queue that. And right. That automatically breaks, the post analysis automatically breaks it. Okay. So we'll give that an execution. Now we're going to do some audience participation. Damien, I need you for a minute. Oh, sweet. <laughs> stay, stay there. All right. He's going to be participating. Okay, one minute. So while that, <laughs> thank you. A little flourish. I'll tell you when to do the flourish. Okay. So this is going to go and do the build for us. It's going to fetch this source code. And of course, there are going to be some issues. It'd be a really lame demo if it, if it kind of worked, huh? You know what's really bad is when you sort of build that up and, and you realize you made a mistake. It's like, damn it. Okay. So Nougat's getting the package. Drum roll. Participation. There we go. See? Excellent. Solid drum roll. <laughs> Jazz hands. Ooh, that's excellent. And, and when this works, it's going to be star jumps. Yeah. Followed by, oh. followed by what are you, this is not a tetanus session. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if this picks up a bug, we're 10 push-ups. 15, anyway. Vance is on 15. All right, so we're doing the cred scan right now. Going and having a look at that. And we might find some issues. I've extended this as well. So in addition to the usual three, I've also included um, some issues in a PowerShell file. Um, I'm putting some issues into... Uh, actually, I didn't do it in this example, but we want to go and have a look at ARM templates and the parameter files. Again, that's a nice place where developers <coughs> like to go and sneak some things. Have you ever snuck any passwords and credentials into source code? Oh, never. Never? <laughs> See? <laughs> oh, anyway. so, Did you put to do? <laughs> to do. Here's a password. To do. Got to do this later. Okay. All right. Get some stretches. Start the stretches for the, the push-ups. All right. So that piece, that PowerShell, is it actually CredScan launching a PowerShell, or is it? Is that something you? Um... So the so there's two two things here. So that task is a wrapper for the PowerShell uh, for, for CredScan. Uh, so CredScan's a tool you can go and have a look at it on um, GitHub now. Yep. Um, 
in addition to that, there's a PowerShell script in my source that has a, a, a password editor. Oh, okay. So oh, there's so a couple of PowerShell things that play in. Yeah. Okay. So we've run the print scan. It succeeded. Succeeded. Oh, all good. It's green. Ship it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Already have. <laughs> Production is my playground. Published from the Hill Studio. Right click publish, yeah. <laughs> Where's Damien Brady when you need him? <laughs> All right, creating the code analysis security report. Publishing it. Oh, the logs are going up there. Does this run faster on the uh, US data center than the Australian one? US data center always runs faster. <laughs> that, that's running in the US. Which one? Oh, yes. <laughs> Where are you going with that, Richard? Oh. All right. Fantastic. Well, Star Jump. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Stop shipping it. <laughs> what do you reckon? Two, two, two out of ten for that Star Jump? <laughs> Let's go for a five out of ten. Five. Come on! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just continue waiting there for a minute. <laughs> So much more gullible with that. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Aw, Richard. <laughs> All right. So, we've got some, some, some red. It goes faster, right? So, if we want to go and have a look at our logs up here, so I can go and say, show me the artifacts. We've now got this code analysis logs. If I select that and look at what's inside it, you'll see we've got a folder for the credential scanner. If, we've had, if we have additional tools in there, there'll be more folders logically. Inside that, I expect to find, I think, just the XML results there. And it's created that, oh, I'm just getting emails saying, don't release it. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go and download that HTML file. So this is the human readable version. So I'll go and choose to open that file. And what we see there is that we've found secrets in files. It's triggered on a PowerShell file, it's triggered on some uh, config files. Now as a human readable thing, we wanna go and have a look at it. So I can say, oh, show me, what do you mean there's a problem? Click. And that's going to take us into Azure repos, into the particular repository for us, find the file in question, bring the file up, and highlight exactly where the issue is. Okay. Do you know how much you know, sad joy I get <laughs> out of running this for the first time on client sites? <laughs> <laughs> And how quickly they shut it down because it's like, hey, dude, that's your details. Is that your password? No. Poor <laughs> 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 yes, <it is. laughs> uh, uh, And I can be like that because I don't write any code anymore, which is great. So my code's perfect. <laughs> if you can find it, scan it. All right. So we go and solve that problem. We check that in, and hopefully things are going to be very much better. Okay. Um, so can you see that's a very, very quick way? of introducing some basic scanning around preventing some of those secrets being added in the right Is that extension available um, for on-prem as well? I don't recall that it is. Okay. Possibly, um, I'm trying to think. It was on three weeks ago when I wrote the case. <laughs> okay. I checked. <laughs> <laughs> And if you sign up for the private preview, um, I can show you the URL for that, um, then there'll be additional tools available to you. Yes, please. Yes, please. So it, it is specific to the language that it looks at. Um, we've got a limited number of searches there today. There's 36 in version one, version two is adding quite a few new, much smarter ones that have um, that, that, that understand more context. So it understands JSON files. Yeah, um, we'll um, it more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so V2 is definitely a, a, a more enhanced version. Hey, hey, bugger. That's a birthday party to remember. <laughs> right. yeah. Forget the presentation. Who wants to know what happened to those guests? She doesn't look disappointed either. That's <laughs> so, what makes it worse is there's fireworks in the. It's all too gloom. I'm not even. All right. 
so that's where you can go and sign up for the Microsoft Security Code Analysis tools. Quick, a flourish. Ta-da! <laughs> are, are you sending that through or? Um, no. Am I just photographing it? <laughs> no. What is it that these people just want, want, want? Want, 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 want. Always. Needy, mate. <laughs> so what, what tools? What tools? Are the extended tools? So if you've been here earlier, you yeah, would have seen them, right? Oh, so, so. <laughs> well, that's okay. Just ask them to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a quiz. <laughs> I'll, point to, I'll, point to the, I'll point you to the stream at the end, eh? How's that? So some of the tools are a binary scanner, uh, Binskim. There'll be tools like TS Lint. There's Roslyn Analyzers go in there. Our fuzzing tool solution's in there. Um, at the moment, it's about six tools, but we're building on that. Okay. Um, so there'll be quite a few more. Plus, we've got integrations with other third-party um, tools. Tools. Is that also known as Analyzer Analyzer? Is that the one also where you can get the uh, code check in Visual Studio? Is that the same thing? Where you can use a dot and it starts to, or is that different? I think it's a different one. Okay. But I will make mention of that because you're yeah. thinking of something that's part of the. Um, you can download it independently in Visual Studio, but technically they say it's part of the uh, yeah, Visual Security Kit. Yeah, yeah. And you think that's a different one? Because, so the, the security analysis. I, I have no idea, I'm just trying to sound smart. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> which which okay. would have worked and said, we Jeez, dude. Adding value. Jeez. Well done. So, you know who's going to put most of the weight for the next boot camp, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get out of there. Um, so we found the, the evil code that Damien put in there. Uh, all right, let's go back here. And it was a great demonstration until that moment. So no vulnerabilities in open source code. What's that? A lie. Huh? A lie. Berlin Wall. Oh, no one got Is that where the, the people who did the Russian doping now live? <laughs> <laughs> it's a person. Did you say something? Berlin Wall. It is the Berlin Wall. Excellent. Oh, nice. um, I was there when it came down. So the, <laughs> it's interesting, like you look at the east side and it's all like that. You look at the west side, it's all graffiti and pictures and paintings and all sorts of things. So it is the Berlin Wall, very good. Um, Show my age. <laughs> <laughs> that particular piece is in um, pieces. So we're a piece in, on campus, aren't we? Mm. So you can go and see pieces of the wall. This particular part is in the museum in Washington, D.C. Um, and they've also got one of the very few remaining um, guard towers, which you can see. It's very confrontational. But uh, it's a free museum in Washington uh, called the Museum. Uh, so it's all about news and all sorts of things there. You can sort of look at the headlines uh, for each of the different years going back so far. It's a really good thing to see. It's all free, uh, which is also a bonus if you take it sort of, you know, the tribe along as well. That's a bit more expensive. Yeah, yeah. By the time you fly the tribe over there, you can't afford to do any of that. Uh, the free museums are a good choice. Free. <laughs> All right, so uh, in terms of known vulnerabilities, so what, this is one of the biggest challenges. So there's been many, well, unfortunately, a growing number of exploits uh, that we're learning about to do with open source software. I mean, we all use open source. Absolutely no question about it. Microsoft is one of the single biggest contributors to the open source community, and we're also a really big consumer of this. So one of the challenges we have is what if those actors were to get in there, modify that open source, put all sorts of you know, nasty software in there. Recently, some of the uh, more common exploits we've learned about uh, include code that goes and scans local hard drives looking for crypto vaults uh, to try and find you know, cryptocurrency. One of the more common ones that we've, that we've heard of um, mention of was of course Equifax. So the Equifax breach was, a, you know, it was a number of systemic problems. It was also a, a digital certificate they failed to renew and that was what was doing the scanning to try and prevent things. But they used Apache, Apache Struts. Um, so Apache Struts is a very common open source you know, framework and when they brought out version 2 they said hey it's got all these great new features and we've fixed all these security bugs and problems and vulnerabilities. You know, the day that that gets put in the public domain, what happens? Those evil, nefarious people like Ray, they go in there and they start trying to exploit those things. They start scanning. Let's go and find anyone that's using struts prior to version 2. And they find Equifax going, hey, pick me, pick me, like that. And I think they were able to get in for something like nine weeks. 
So they, were, they got in undetected through uh, an exploit in Apache Struts. They had unfettered access to something like 51 databases and I think it was 145 million, uh, don't quote the numbers, but something like 145 million unique credentials. And this is a credit reporting agency. So this is the ultimate in PII data. Name, social security number, address, and in some cases, driver's license. You know, exactly the kind of stuff you don't want out in the public domain. Um, it, was, it was just extraordinary. So if you think about it, this, the, the actual exploit occurred within four weeks of version two coming out. How many of you work in organizations where when a new version of an open source package come out, you, get, you go, oh great, you get it, you recompile the applications so that you get <coughs> all of them, you redeploy all those applications and you do that within four weeks. Sorry? <laughs> Quicker. Quicker. <laughs> One of the benefits of working for a government agency is that doesn't happen. <laughs> We're two years behind. And no one writes for so Shakespeare than already have. Yeah. <laughs> a government agency is never a target. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask the Bureau of Statistics. So, some of the tools. Um, through a, a partnership working closely with White Source, we have a, a thing called White Source Vault. That's been made available by White Source as a company free of charge to users of Azure DevOps. Okay. Who uses that one? Awesome. Are there limitations though on the amount? Yes. So the free version has uh, some limits there to the number of scans it'll do per day. Yeah. Um, one thing I haven't seen from White Source that I've given some feedback to them on, uh, I just want to see, because I, I introduce it to some customers and they think, okay, we want this. What's the difference with the paid version? Just, just give me a table. Yeah. Features, free, pay, tick, 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 tick. Very difficult. I've struggled to find such a thing. Um, and I've given them that feedback to say, look, I think you can sell a lot more if you have this kind of table. Um, you know, we're happy to give you money if there's an associated value. Um, help us with this. So the way that we use that is if we go back over, I think I've got it in this one here as well. So what we've got here is White Source Vault. So you simply go and add it through the marketplace. You will register it. Uh, again, this is the free version of it. You add that into the pipeline. And in this case, I've done absolutely zero configuration. By default, it's going to look in the sources directory. And what that produces for us is a really interesting result. So if I go back and have a look at an execution of that pipeline, let's have a look at it, one of the reports that it creates. So right now it's saying the vulnerability score is high. Um, and that's not to be, you know, that's not unexpected when you think that the actual application code for Parts Unlimited is quite a few years old. What is a little bit less exciting is the majority of the security issues uh, are Microsoft packages. <laughs> uh, and and that's, that's fine. It's the, the, the issue here is so frequently an exploit is found, a problem is done, so the vendor of the package, whoever that may be, will go in there and they'll update that, they'll close it. That's a constant cycle. So while ever you are referencing libraries and packages that age, and that is all of them, uh, this risk occurs. The other interesting thing is another risk that's slightly different. Not all open source licenses are created the same. Fortunately, many of the most popular open source licenses are very open and forgiving. Some of them, um, there's been some nice honeypots in the US where they release something under an open source license, but it's a custom license that says you must go and have this company logo on your home page. It must be in the about box. No one reads that stuff. So as a honeypot, they want you to use their packages in big commercial products, go and sell it to millions of people and they'll just sit there in the background lurking and once you've made your first couple of million dollars, they'll come out of the woodwork and litigate. Yeah, lovely world we live in sometimes. Mm. 
So tracking the licenses, having an inventory of the packages that you're using, looking at databases to identify which of those packages have known exploits. This is something that White Source does. And if we have a look there, it lists some of the security vulnerabilities, it rates those things for us, it lists all of the different licenses that are there. Okay, so we get down here, 206 outdated libraries out of 242. <coughs> Woohoo! <laughs> We're still not there yet, it's not 100%. Um, I reckon a few more months of doing the demonstration, we'll hit 100%. Okay. Uh, so as something that we can put into the pipeline very, very easily, subject to a limited number of scans per day, uh, I think this adds enormous value. There are other vendors as well. Blackback's another very common one. Anyone have any other scanning uh, tools like Fossa? Sorry? Fossa, I think. Oh, I haven't used that one. Yeah. There's one in no. NPM. I mean, we need these things. We need more and more of them. I'd love to see this sort of thing automatically built into uh, tools like um, Azure Artifacts. I'd like to have a, a, you know, a single point of ingress within an organisation where these things come in, where we can sort of you know, have the, the gatekeeper there do the scanning. Yeah. I'd like to be able to cache some of those licenses. Makes that sometimes challenging. We we use MyGet for that reason. Okay. It's the artifact. Everything goes through it, and we all reference straight from NuGet but all build pull through my get, so we get that single, and they do the, I think they probably use white source on the whole the library, it's pretty much identical. Yeah, so, I mean, we seriously need to do that if we're not already doing it. Okay. Um, so that's a tool that you can add into a pipeline quickly and easily. That one? Paris? Yes, of course, it's Paris, yes. Well, there's always signs saying, please don't do this as you know, parts <laughs> of the railings keep falling into the river under the weight of all of those bad locks. Um, what was that? That was 2013, that photo, I think. Haven't, I just, haven't they cut them all off? I think yeah, they, they do. They, they, they come really back like very, like very, very, very quickly. It's like the, chew, the chewing gum wall in Seattle. Yeah, that's gross, though. <laughs> 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 no, I can't <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's right. All of them, I keep saying... <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah, it's just a plastic. <laughs> I don't know, most of them are. I just keep stop, stop. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to talk about it finally. The, <laughs> <laughs> the security <laughs> DevOps kit for Azure. Uh, this is a big kit, um, mm. far beyond just this, you know, the time we would have today. It's something we could easily do an entire session on without question. I want to call out just a few of the the initial parts of this kit for, for reference, because it's something that you can put into your pipelines uh, comparatively easily. Okay, um, that's where you get it from. And you can install it directly onto your local machine. So simply open up PowerShell, run a PowerShell command, and it will install that kit on your local machine. Once you've got that, and it's a series of um, you know, things like PowerShell scripts and, and guidance and so forth, you can then start executing commands directly from your machine. You can point it up to your Azure subscription. You can point it to particular resource groups within that subscription. You can point it to your um, templates, JSON files locally, and have it start doing some scanning for you. So it's well worth having a look at. We do keep this up to date. So we do, I think, monthly releases of this kit. Okay? And we use these tools ourselves internally. If we have a look at some of the things that are in there, um, the first thing is we want to have a look at subscription security. So this is about policy, configuration, alerts, role-based authentication. We want to be able to make sure that our subscription is secure. We want to be able to have security IntelliSense. That's something that you can add into Visual Studio 2017, 2019, and that will give you security in your IntelliSense. It will tell you that you really don't want to use that crypto library. It's cryptographically really, really weak. You should be using this instead. Um, so that's, that's available today. Um, we want to have a look at some of those security uh, verification tests. So uh, they're a little bit interesting. So when you get started with those security verification tests, it's going to find all manner of issues and problems, absolutely. Um, I'll show you a sample of what that looks like. There are some components that we can add into our pipelines, things like the ARM <coughs> template checker that can go in there and have a look at the ARM template prior to us deploying the um, IAC results up to the cloud. 
We've also got tools in there that will run those security verification tests against Azure as well. So we'll touch briefly on those first three. There's also things like continuous assurance runbooks. So this is around uh, going and creating Azure automation scripts, setting them up so that we're looking for configuration drift with a focus more on security. So let's go and execute our security verification tests every day. So this has got the automation, the runbooks in there to do that for you so that if a well-intentioned person goes into your Azure subscription, goes and makes a setting change, modifies something that's potentially now weakened security, this will go and determine that. Okay? Um, again, uh, you know, just last week, they were confident that every website <coughs> that goes to Azure is supported only HTTPS. We ran the tool and it turns out well, that's not quite right. Um, so that was a setting that they felt confident that they had universally applied. Turns out they hadn't. So they identified at least a dozen instances where there were Azure websites that would respond to HTTP requests. Okay, we're looking at JSON files for each of those things. We also, this can get, there can be a lot of noise here, particularly in large subscriptions where you're doing a lot of work. So being able to use log analytics to be able to have that single point to pull these things together, to be able to flag things, alert and report on those, to be able to then get that information and allow you to do some risk governance, to have a look at the, the different you know, knobs and switches that you've set. And sometimes it's loosening a couple to make things you know, work. And more often than not, it's gradually increasing more and more controls. You can't go and turn every control on. It will basically stop every functioning application you've got there. Um, so let's find out what we've got. Let's put a, uh, a a process in place to gradually tighten some of the locks that we've got. Um, so that's something really, really helpful. Sorry, I'm looking at the time there. So secure your cloud subscription. So this is looking at things like policy, role-based uh, access control. So what you can see here is we can execute a PowerShell script up the top there. What that's going to do is that one's pointed at our subscription. It's going to go and run all of these SVTs against the subscription and produce output. If we have a look at the output there, so I pointed this to my own Azure subscription, it takes quite a while to run through all of those tests. I won't do that live for you, but this is the output it creates. So it gives me a lot of information as a CSV. There is also another switch you can use and it will create a PDF for you. So my subscription is nice and secure, as you would hope and expect, and that's 68 pages of issues. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are low, see, see? <laughs> Winning. Exactly right. <laughs> and, and I, I think I broke it, I looked at that and said, there's way too much here, there's no chance we can create a table of contents with all this stuff. Uh, so I just gave up. Um, and then we can go and have a look at that. So I might go and have a look at this little core web application. You'll see the output, it's gone and scanned Key Vault. Let's have a look at the uh, storage account there, the virtual machine, the virtual networks. So I can go and dig into all these log files to find out exactly what's going on there. Um, so it's quite comprehensive. And that was something that I executed just from my local machine, authenticated, pointed up to my subscription and said, away you go. We can put this into a pipeline and point specifically to just the resource group. So as part of a release pipeline, uh, what I'll show you in a moment, is we want to check the ARM template to make sure there's nothing silly. If we get past that, we'll go and deploy the infrastructure, we'll deploy the application, and then at the end of it, we'll run a series of verification tests now to make sure that post-release of this, everything still you know, maintains its security intact for us. Okay. We jump back over here. Hey, Anthony, uh, the report which you just shown in the PDF, yes. isn't that the same available on Azure Security Center on a portal? I haven't looked. Um, I would suspect it may be, but I honestly don't know. Can anyone answer that question? Sorry, it was up there very, very quickly. You probably don't didn't see enough to do that comparison. These are the it tools we to use that. ourselves internally. So it wouldn't surprise me that a lot of this, this content from this team would be bubbling up through Azure Security Center. So without honestly knowing, I would strongly suggest it's exactly the same tool. Yeah, I've seen the similar output from there. 
Hopefully not as bad as that output. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 All right. So I would expect that. I'm happy to have all the points. Okay, thanks. Um, in the next one then, so the developer security spot checks, security checks. So there's an example of some of that in IntelliSense just here and the SVT. So if you have a look, in terms of IntelliSense, someone's gone up here and said, you know, create one of these things. IntelliSense pops up and says that's an insecure security algorithm and we recommend you use this instead. So this is really sh shift <coughs> left as far as you can shift left mm. from a security perspective. The moment the developer writes the code, IntelliSense pops that up, flags it, and offers a suggestion or recommendation on how to make that better. That's available today. You simply go into the, your um, individual studio, go into the marketplace and you can go and add that into 2017 and 2019. Yeah. Okay. So um, what was that again? Was that the Roslyn code analyzer or? No, that, that, that was a good question, but was that? <laughs> it looks awesome. Security intelligence. I went and added it, I'll have to have a look yeah. um, to find out exactly what that name is. Okay. Um, so there's the command there. Again, we're doing at least 35 services. So it doesn't scan for and understand security across everything in Asia today. It's typically lagging behind. I mean, the rate with which we're releasing new services in Asia is extraordinary. So uh, it, it's, it's not going to be able to look at some of the, the new things that we've got there today. Okay. The outputs are generated. So you can see there, we've got text files, log files. We can open it in, um, in Excel. It's, it's also going to generate some issues. So for example, one of the things that it comes up is to do with uh, business continuity disaster uh, recovery. And it says, hey, with this website, you need to increase the instant count so you've got redundancy across two instances. You may not want to do that for some of your applications. Absolutely. So how can we go in there and ignore some of those rules or recommendations that simply don't apply? And there will be some, definitely. So what you do is you run that tool, that tool produces a CSV file. You open the CSV file and you will see all of those particular rules. You go in there and simply delete all of the ones that are okay. Uh, I'll show you this in a moment. Leaving just the failed rules you don't care about, you save that CSV file back out again and that becomes your exclusion list. Okay, it is well documented. Uh, but that's important, otherwise you know, the, the, the risk you, you have is that you learn or you teach yourself just to ignore the noise. Oh, that's just the normal security errors. Uh, and all of a sudden some real significant ones sneak their way in there. Okay. Uh, in terms of our pipeline, we want to basically be able to validate the ARM templates we're deploying. In this example here, you'll see that we've got a number of failures there already over time, so let's skip that and go right to the demo. Uh, okay, so in this particular example, if I go into my pipeline and have a look at the build, I'm simply building a stock standard web application. Okay, nothing really overly interesting in that pipeline. I do go here and go and grab that infrastructure folder and include the ARM templates in the artifact that's produced by the build. Nothing overly special there. If I jump into the release, okay, what we see here is if I run it with basically the default settings, so I go and create a simple web application, and to be clear, this is the simplest web application I can create in Azure. If we have a look at the output of that, <coughs> Okay, so it's failed. Okay, so there's a security control failing for your ARM templates. If I drill in and have a closer look at it, you'll see up here, failed. And all of those tests <coughs> have failed. Now, I was feeling pretty confident, it was a simple website, but the ARM template checker has gone through and found those issues. If we look at that particular pipeline, I've added into the pipeline this tool here, which is the ARM template checker. That's part of the Azure Security Kit. We can go and download that and add it, add it as an add-in into Azure DevOps through the marketplace. 
what you'll see here is I point to the ARM template, I point to the parameters file that I'm using. Okay. That's all I need to do is put that one object in there, that one task, point to the ARM templates, and you can point to a directory, you can tell it to do it recursively. If it finds a number of link templates in that folder, it will go and scan all of those things for us. Okay. I then go and configure the infrastructure, grab some outputs, deploy the infrastructure, and the last thing I do here is to then go and run those the full security verification checks. So to be clear, that's looking at about nine rules for the ARM template checker for the website. This one here is doing a lot more of an exhaustive test well beyond just those nine. So I can pass at the template checker level for just the template I'm giving it, but down here I can still fail many times. If we go and have a look, this one I've done a little bit more work here. And the goal is we want to do these checks and tests, and if there are any security issues found, then we stop and we do, we, we do not allow the deployment to continue through other regions. Okay. So if we have a look at the output of this particular build, I've added an additional tool in here. Um, one of the things that I found, uh, sorry, I should have an intermediary step here and I haven't done that. Um, one of the things that I found is when you execute this, it reports all of these logs, all of these issues, you'll see a failure, you've got to go and open up the log. Uh, a better way would be to use something like Log Analytics to be able to tell these tools to report to Log Analytics, use Log Analytics to analyze that information, to raise the appropriate alerts, and to you know, produce some form of you know, visualization of that data. So what I like about this one is, if I click on tests, what do you normally see? Unit tests. So what we see here is there's this great little tool. It's only been downloaded, I think, like 40 times out of the marketplace. And what it does is it converts the results of the template checker into a NuGet test results file. And then you can upload that as part of your build. And what we're seeing here is there were 12 tests and two of them failed. And these were two issues um, that were raised in the ARM template checker. Uh, so I'll show you what that is because it's a pretty neat little thing in my opinion. Okay, so if we go and have a look at that. Okay, so there's the ARM template checker and that's that little tool I was talking about. So it's AZSK, the abbreviation for the Azure Security Kit, um, and unit converter. That's mm. the variable that it creates. So it goes and gets the output of the previous task, puts it into a variable in the pipeline for us, and then here all I'm doing is grabbing the content of that variable and uploading it as test results. Um, that's that's really cool, I like that. Okay, um, I then configure the, assuming everything worked, I go ahead and configure it, again, deploy it, and then I run my verification tests. Um, so that's something that if you are using uh, ARM templates and you're doing those deployments, I think this is a very, very useful thing to add into your pipeline. When, uh, can we jump into the repos? Oh, sorry, there was another step there I didn't show you. So, guys, probably just maybe another five minutes. Sorry, I've gone over time. Uh, if I go into my releases there, pop back into the pipeline. What I wanted to show you here is in the ARM template checker, I point to the template the parameters file. Here's where I point to that CSV file I spoke about. So you run it the first time, it comes up with all the errors. That said, I've got seven that are passing and two that are failing. Those two were things like having to go and backend the application to Azure Active Directory for authentication. It's like, no, I don't want that. It's a public facing website. And another issue, I can't remember what it was. So I literally went, got that CSV file, opened it in Excel, highlighted the seven that had passed, deleted them, saved the file, added it back into version control, and that's where I can say, I want to exclude or skip these controls from the scan. Okay. So that was quite useful. If we have a look at, and if we have a look at the results of that, So in the template checker, notice here that I've got these ones that are passing and two that I'm choosing to skip. That's where you can see it. 
To give you an idea of what those are about in this example, if I go back into my repo, into here, So I've decorated the parameters file for the purposes of demonstration. So what you see there is that capacity is an example. So there's a rule around business continuity and disaster recovery that says you should have multiple instances. So I've simply gone and added two there to say I want to have two instances in that app service plan. Okay, That met that particular rule if that's relevant for you. There are other ones, um, always on, true. So that stops the website from going to sleep. I'm not sure why that's a security issue, but that's okay, we picked it up and used it. This one here, don't allow HTTP access, true. Okay. You can also set organizational standards. So you can basically create an organizational baseline of these values and then report on that baseline separately to then the particular issues for this deployment. So that's quite useful. But for a lot of those rules, these are some of the settings that will help you get past it. When you go into the uh, Azure Security Kit for, um, for DevOps, uh, they give you samples of many of these, not all of them. There'll be plenty of rules there that you think, what the heck's that about? And good luck Googling or thinking for it. Uh, in this particular case, I was able to go in, uh, look at the documentation, it said here's some um, templates as samples in GitHub, and that's where uh, a lot of these came from. Um, so I can tell you how to get that pipeline to be a bit more compliant again. Okay. So there's a lot more in that particular tool than I've been able to speak about this morning. Um, if I just jump backwards for a minute. So it's well worth taking a look at it. The URL's just coming up in a moment eventually we'll get there. Really? I didn't include the URL. <laughs> it's a security. That's right, that's right. It, it got picked up and <laughs> please jump back to the top. There you go, up the top there. That'll work. Awesome. But I think I had a pretty picture. Surely I had a pretty picture. <laughs> hey, there we go. Oh, awesome. Yes, I did have the URL way up the top there. So go and have a look. There is a lot of information, a lot of goodness in there, a lot of guidance that you can have a look at. Um, well worth spending some time. And it will take a little bit of time to get your way through those. Um, it's big. It's big. <laughs> definitely big it's uh, and it's of course being updated and changed every month so you know I expect to be able to do that exact same demonstration in a couple of months to come and where I go and there's two errors there'll be ten <coughs> going, yes, excellent that'll be just a different part of the story all right um, so hopefully what I've shown you there where's the dev suit don't you love it when you when you're trying to struggle with just with PowerPoint that's what I do, you know. Um, where's that one? Antelope Canyon. No? There's a background from Windows 7. Is Antelope Canyon the really popular one? There's two. There's two, correct. This is the least, the, the lesser of the two. The other one was just the crowds were stupid. Yeah. So it's not Antelope. Antelope, I think, is the world it's famous one. Yeah. This is the second one, which is great. So much better. Um, but very, good, very close. So guys, um, thanks. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about how you can include some security scanning into your Azure DevOps pipelines. Um, a few things to start with. You saw that cred scan is really, really quick and easy to be added into, uh, into a pipeline. And you can find those things that as developers we've all done, hopefully not recently, but um, you would be surprised what you find when you run tools like that. If you wanted to sign up for that pre free preview, there's other tools in there that I think would be really, really beneficial for you to include in, in the pipelines. Um, you also saw me talk about the Azure Security Kit there. Um, have a look at things like White Source Bolt. Um, if that one is a free one that's been worked on in conjunction with White Source and Microsoft. Um, also look at Black Duck, also try and figure out what the benefits of paying for White Source are. I'm sure there's plenty. It'll do something like 200 different languages. Uh, heck, it'll go back and do DB6 for you. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yep. That's important for Damien, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you can be careful. Uh, were there any other questions before we go out to the pub? To the pub, yeah. No. Is there a traditional <laughs> after a user group get up to the pub? <laughs> All right, so at uh, quarter past nine, anyone know a pub that's open here? Casino. 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 Casino.
Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you all for coming along, and uh, we hope to see most of you guys, or everyone, uh, at the next meeting, which will be the first Friday of next month. So which I'll be hosting. I'll be hosting. We'll be hosting. Be hosting. Thanks, Doug. Cheers. I'm not being still. still. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, don't worry. Me talking to your face. Thanks for coming along, guys. Enjoy your Friday. Thank you.